In this episode of Be Hooked Crochet, we're going to work through the techniques you'll need to know to crochet my latest pattern featuring Red Heart Boutique Unforgettable Yarn, one of my absolute favorites. My name is Brittany and I'm so excited to share this new project with you. Well, before we begin, head over to BeHookedCrochet.com slash hairpin lace scarf to view the pattern and the supplies you'll need to prepare to finish your scarf. Are you ready to give hairpin lace a try? We'll begin with the first step right after this. Now before we can really dive into this project, there's a couple of things we need to get in order before we begin. Now you should have a hairpin lace loom that looks something like this. There are several different variations available for you to purchase. It doesn't matter what brand or what type you're using, you wanna set it up so that your bars are three inches apart. Then once you have that, we need to make sure we have one, the, the top part is removed from the loom, we have the bottom part situated that's securing the two bars. Once we have that, we can go ahead and grab our yarn and create a slip knot. So starting in hairpin lace is very similar to standard crochet, but we can't tighten the slip knot down so far that we would, if we were placing it on our hook, we would, we would just secure it up like that. Well, we can't do that because our slip knot needs to be in the middle or the spine of the strip that we're going to be working. So just leave yourself a nice big long loop and you have your slip knot there. And the first thing you want to do is place your loop around this side of the loom. And then we're simply going to wrap it around. So just get your tail out of the way that's facing down. And you want to be careful of the amount of tension you're putting on your working strand because if you pull on it, you're gonna tighten up your slip knot and that's gonna make your spine crooked. So we, we actually want that slip knot to be as close to the center of these two bars as possible. So what I like to do is grab a hold of the working yarn because you need to gather it up in your yarn hand like you normally would, but you need to be mindful of the amount of pressure that you're putting on it. So I'm pinching it off here so I can put pressure on it and it's not moving that slip knot. Now, if you need to adjust, then you can pull that and you can see the slip knot moving there. Or if you've moved it too far, just kind of release it and get it situated so it's roughly in the middle. Now from here, you'll need to grab your crochet hook and insert it in between that slip knot. So it's right in the middle, right next to the slip knot. Grab your working yarn and just pull it through. Now from here, you'll need to just make a chain. So grab your working yarn and I'm pinching it off here at the bottom so I don't allow that slip knot to move. Grab the working yarn and chain one. Now the cool part about hairpin lace is how the technique works. So our hook always has to be at the front here so we can work with it, right? But in order to make the loops or to wrap the stitches around the loom, we have to flip it over. If we were to flip it just from here, our hook would be in the back of the work. So the movement that we need to get really familiar with doing is taking our hook, flipping it, so I'm going handle in first and coming back out the back. So I situate it that way. When I do that, I can go ahead and flip the loom in that direction. And I'm set up to work the next stitch. Now I'm being super careful here because I only have one stitch on the loom. And if I pull too hard, then that slip knot is going to shift over and I really don't want that to happen. From here, what you'll need to do is focus in on this loop here. We're actually always going to be focusing our attention on the topmost loop. Well here, it's the only one we have. So You'll insert your hook in between the two loops so you can see there's a loop at the back and there's a loop at the front. My hook is in between them. Then you'll grab your working yarn and you'll pull up a loop. So we have those two loops on our hook and we're going to work a single crochet just like we're norm, just like we're comfortable with working. So grab the working yarn, you see make a yarn over, and then pull through both of those loops. So it's just a normal single crochet. 
Well, now we're at the point where we need to turn the loom over. So to do that, we just need to rotate our hook around and then flip the loom. Now, when you look over here, we have two loops or two stitches on our loom because we've wrapped it twice. So I'm focusing in just on that top loop. I've worked my hook in between them. So I'm just gonna push this one down here so you can see that there's a front loop and a back loop to this, this wrap and I've got my hook in between them. I'm gonna work that single crochet. So just grab your working yarn, pull up a loop, yarn over and pull through two. Now here we can we can pretty much let go of the working yarn. We don't have to worry so much about the slip knot moving. We have a few stitches on our loom. So what we need to do is secure the top part to the loom. And like I said, this is gonna vary from, from loom to loom. It really depends on your manufacturer. But you wanna make sure you get a couple of stitches situated just so you can safely put it down and not have to worry about that slip knot moving around on you. So once you have that in place, we're just gonna repeat these steps over and over. So every time you finish a single crochet on the front, then you're going to move your hook to the back of the loom and then flip it over. Then isolate that top loop. And I always do that with my thumb. You just saw me do that kind of naturally. I push it up so it's easy to access, I'm putting my hook in between them and I'm making a single crochet. So I hold on to my working yarn with my, my index finger like I normally do, and then I kind of hold on to the loom with my ring finger and my pinky back here, or you can steady it on your lap or the table you're working on too. After you've worked a few stitches, this is what, what it looks like. You can see that spine that I was talking about right in the middle, and that's gonna be a design element on its own. And then we have these loops off to the side, and we're gonna play with these loops, and that's gonna give it a, a kind of a lacy appearance on one side, and then a braided appearance on the other side. So the last little bit of advice I wanna give you before I set you off to work your first strip is that we need to maintain the habit of counting our loops. We're going to group them off. I'm going to show you how to do that next to make your life so much easier. But just take note that at any given point, you could have one more loop on one side versus the other. And that's because we're flipping from back to forth. So when you count your loops, you don't want to just count one side. You want to actually count both and make sure that you have the right number on both sides. And basically one loop is one stitch and you'll just count them off and continue working. And like I said, I'll, I'll demonstrate how to group them together next. The other thing I wanna point out is that some people, when working the hairpin lace technique, they use what are called guides. Guides are basically a strip of yarn, that's like a scrap piece of yarn that you align with the bars of your loom. So I would basically just take a scrap piece of yarn lay it along the bar, and maybe even feed it through the loom, like it would work with this loom, maybe not so much with others. And that would serve as your guide to keep the loops in order because it looks nice and tidy while they're on the loom, but eventually we're gonna have to take it off the loom. And then the loops can get twisted and things can get really messy and really ugly, and we want to avoid that. I personally don't, use guides. It's not something, it's not a method that works for me, but the method that I found works for me is grouping them off. So scrunching a section together and grouping that section of loops. So I've counted them. I know, let's say there are 25 loops in this group. I know that I never have to go back and count and the loops are always going to be nice and tidy. So let's have a look at how to group your loops, your stitches together. After you've worked that stitch over and over, you're eventually gonna to get to the point where your loom fills up just like this. Now you can, of course, scrunch them down 
And I would recommend doing that as long as you can and until it's not comfortable anymore. Well, what you're going to have to do at that point is we're going to have to remove some of the loops from the loom. Now, if you aren't using a guide method where you're crocheting over a scrap piece of yarn, you're definitely going to need to section off some of the loops, group them together somehow. So what I like doing is using a locking stitch marker. These are just the standard size from Clover. And I like using these a lot with hairpin lace projects because I can just lock some loops together and they stay nice and tidy. And it really helps when you're trying to work these strips together, which we'll see in, in some later steps. So the first thing you'll need to do is count out your loops. Now I do start from the bottom. So this is my working edge. I'm not fastening off or anything. I'm just gonna flip it upside down so that I can see the first loops that I made. And you're just gonna pick a number. Now what I found is that 25 loops will fit pretty comfortably in this size locking stitch marker. If you do have the larger ones, you can probably fit more. But for now, just stick with 25. It's a good number to work with. And you'll just count them out on each side because as we're working back and forth, we, at any given time, we, we can end up with one loop fewer on one side versus the next. It just depends on where we stop. So you're just going to count out 25 loops on each side. And once you have those groups counted out, you have, you have your 25 loops, then I just went ahead and placed a stitch marker around just the side of the loom. So I know that that is 25 loops or 25 stitches. And then I'm gonna focus in on the other side. I don't have this one marked because really what I wanna do is not just mark the, the place on the bar here, but I actually want to grab the loops. So there's a couple of ways to do this. Honestly, it's a little bit fiddly. Some of you may not like using this method, but it works for me. So I'm, I'm gonna demonstrate it here. What I like to do is just kind of squish my finger in between the loops because I, I wanna make sure that I'm catching just one side. That's just gonna make things a lot easier later on. And just slide the stitch marker under all of them and then lock it. And then that is forever. 25 loops, I never have to think about it again, and I'll just do the same thing on the other side. So just do this as you go along. When you know that you have about 25 stitches, just go ahead and group them up. If you don't have these locking stitch markers, the other thing you could use, if you have a really large safety pin and you're comfortable, you're not gonna stick your fingers, you can use those as well, or scrap pieces of yarn work just as, as well. So. What you'll need to do at that point is just kind of wiggle your hook underneath all of the loops, kind of like we did here, but just place that scrap piece of yarn on your hook and pull it through and then just tie it off. Well, once you have those marked, let's say you're all ready to go. We have our big long strip. Again, I'm just working with a smaller little snippet of the pattern here. Well, the next thing you'll need to do once you complete the strip, once you have the proper number of loops, all, I mean, it's obviously not all going to fit on your loom at once, but once you have all of the loops that you need, you've counted both sides, so you know that you have that number on each side of the loom, then we can fasten off. And this doesn't look a lot different than fastening off with regular crochet. So all you're going to do is when you get to that point, just trim your working yarn, leave yourself a tail that's about eight inches or so, and then we're just going to take that tail and pull it through that loop on our hook. And then just give that a nice little tug to tighten it up. And that's all there is to it. You fastened off at that point. Now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and group this last section of 25 stitches because I wanna have it nice and tidy. I want everything to be situated together before I remove these from the loom. And then you can just slide everything over and then just keep this in a nice safe place. You don't want it to get like jumbled or messy. As you know, unforgettable yarn, it has a tendency to, to get a little bit fuzzy and we don't want that to happen. So just put it in a nice safe place. Don't let it twist because this little section right here, I mean, you could very easily twist that from one side to the next and then we would have a twist in our scarf and we don't want that. So 
place that right there. Then we're going to work on the next strip. So again, I've got just a really short section of the pattern here to demonstrate how to how to crochet it and how it all comes together. But what you'll need to do is go ahead and make your second strip. It's going to be the exact same stitch count as your first one. And then once you finish that up, I'm going to demonstrate how we're going to put these two together. So there's a joining technique that's going to happen right in the middle of the scarf. And that's what we're going to have a look at next. Once you have your two strips completely crocheted, what you're going to do first, well, you're going to have to have a nice large flat surface, a big table, or work on your bed or something like that on the floor because you need to stretch these out. And I don't really get the full effect of how important that is here when I have just a group of 50. So I'm just working with a much smaller number, but you'll definitely see where this is going to be critically important as you're moving forward. So make sure you have a nice flat surface and you have about, I'm going to say 15 to 20 minutes to completely devote to this part of the pattern because once you start this, it's really not a great place to stop and put it down completely. So you're going to want to finish at least this first initial join before you get distracted or move on to another activity. Okay, the other thing to keep in mind is the placement. So because Unforgettable is such a really pretty color change yarn, we can see that I have two, I have several different colors going on here. And the way they're situated, I'm, I'm focusing in on the middle, this side right here, because this is going to be the braid. Well, think about how you want the colors to come together. And you can always rotate. Like, let's say I want to put this really bright blue with this kind of gray color, and it sort of matches on that other side. Well, then I'm just going to turn it that way. So orient your strips so that the colors come together the way you like them, whatever looks pretty to you. And then the first thing we'll need to do is release just your first stitch marker. So again, I'm working with 25 loops. It's really doable, very comfortable. If you're working with 50, you can also obviously do that as well. Just be a little bit more careful in how the loops don't get disturbed. So just release each side one by one. I'm not really doing anything. I don't want to stretch it out. Just simply release it and let, let it relax a little bit on its own. Now I am using a larger crochet hook to work this braid because just the hook is larger. The gauge doesn't matter here whatsoever. So I'm using the larger hook. This is a six and a half millimeter to just help me work through because I'm going to be grouping five loops at a time. All right, now you have to choose which side you're going to start with. Honestly, it, it doesn't matter. And you're going to place the first five loops on your hook. So just scrunch your work down. The loops are going to naturally kind of twist and you don't want to play with that twist. Just let it do its thing and situate five loops on your hook. Now just leave that there and then jump over to the other side. Again, this is going to twist and kind of do its own thing. And just let it, just let it do that. Let it do what it wants. Grab those next five loops and place them on your hook right after that first group. Then we're going to work all five of these for, well, the second group through the first group. So just use your fingers to help you through this and just bring it through just like that. Now, since we went from this side to this side, we have to go ahead and use the loops from the opposite side. So whatever color you have on your hook, that's going to tell you that you need to jump over to the opposite strip. So I'm going to go back through three, four, five, the next five on that strip, and then pull them through. Now I have the gray on my hook, so that means I need to jump over to this one and then place the next five loops on my hook. And 
and then pull that through. Now it doesn't have to look perfect right now, you just need to be very careful. It'll settle in once we have everything braided, then we can kind of pull on it a little bit and, and settle, settle the, the stitches so it looks a little bit neater. But for now, just make sure you've got your braid going and your loops are twisting in the kind of way that they do naturally. And we're just going to do this for the entire strip. So I'm going to go ahead and speed through this section that is, is still open to me. And then I'll, I'll demonstrate what you need to do once you reach your, your marker or your next stitch when you run out of loops. Okay, once you get through your first section and you've run out of loops, you have the next one tied up, honestly, we're not doing anything different here. We just need to release that next group and then work, work through the braid like we just did. The important takeaway here is that you're only releasing the loops that you're using. And again, 25 at a time really is, is a good spot. You can work with a small section and the loops don't get too uh, too crazy or, or twisted up in, in a weird way. So that's really what I would recommend. Now when you get to the end of your row, let's say that you have an extra loop, or maybe you're one loop short. Don't, don't worry about that. It, it happens sometimes, we miscount, we make mistakes. We're working with a lot of loops here, or you guys are, and it's really easy to, to make a mistake. But I'm here to tell you it's not a big deal. If you have six loops remaining on your last one, or you have four, or even if you have three, you can still work it, and it's not really going to be that noticeable. So it worked out pretty well there. I had I had five there. Let's check the other side and see if I did my my counting correct on both sides. And as it as it turns out I did. So I'm not able to show you a specific example. But if you have too many loops or too few loops, it's not the end of the world. Just go ahead and finish braiding. You don't have to frog it and start over. Just go with it. Now once you've made it to the end of the braid, we have a live loop here on our hook. And we're not, we're not ready just yet to deal with that loop. But if we take our hook out and just leave it, there's a really good chance that this is going to come unbraided and that will be a big huge mess. We don't want that. So I'm going to take a couple of safety precautions. I'm going to grab my two stitch markers. And the first one I'm going to put just in the middle of that loop. Well, I mean, honestly, you can still pull that out. So I'm just holding, this stitch marker is just holding those five loops together. Well, then what I want to do is make sure I catch the five from that other side. And then just, you can either wrap that around the stitch marker here, you can wrap it around the loops, whatever works. And that's going to hold that in place and we'll leave it there until we're ready to address the finishing touches. Now that we have this braid in place, the next thing we need to do is work on this other open side right here. So I still have my two stitch markers in place, grouping those loops together. Well, I'm going to work on one side and just release that stitch marker.
And just like before, just kind of let the loops settle in. I'm not gonna pull them apart or anything like that. I'm just gonna let them do their own thing. You're gonna grab your crochet hook, the size five millimeter, and then we're gonna grab another piece of yarn, make your slip knot, and we're gonna fasten on. So carefully find the first three loops on your open side here and just place your hook in the loops, just letting them kind of twist like they normally would. See how when I turn them like this, it kind of twists and almost looks broomstick lace like, right? Well, just let that happen. Place the new slip knot on your hook, pull it through and make a chain that's going to just secure our, our new yarn here to this little section. Now we aren't actually counting this chain one as a stitch for the purpose of this pattern. So we need to do just for this first group of three, we need to make three single crochets around all three of the loops. So I'm just sticking my hook in the middle of them, just letting them rest on the top, yarn over, pull up a loop, and working my single crochet as I normally would. So I've made two, I need a third for this group. That's going to be for the first group and the last group only. We're gonna work those three single crochets. So the next thing we need to do is isolate the next three loops. So I've got one, two, and three, and then make two single crochets around this group of three. And that's the repeat, it's really simple. Find your next three loops, and you wanna make sure you're getting them in order. That's very important here. And work two single crochets around that group. And you're just gonna continue this until you get to the end of your row. Once you run out of loops, you'll just release your next stitch marker so that you can access that next group of stitches. And work this repeat where you're working two single crochets around three loops and you're making sure that they're twisting. See how, how they're kind of broomstick lace like. We wanna make sure we have that going on. And honestly, I'm just doing that by allowing the stitches to do what they naturally are doing. See how when you look at it like this, it's naturally twisted. So I'm just working with that twist when I place the loops on my hook and make the single crochet, it really just pronounces that twist. So you'll work this until you only have three loops remaining. And when you do that, you're gonna make your three single crochets. So I mentioned that for the last group of three, well, the first group of three and the last group of three, we're gonna have three single crochets. Everything else in between is going to be two single crochets for each group of three loops. Now when you've made it to your last group of three, again, we're gonna work three single crochets around this group of three. But let's say you made a mistake in your counting and you only have two loops, or maybe you have three loops. Well, it's not the end of the world, just like before. If you're one short or if you have one too many, just go ahead and treat it like you did all of the others. It's on the edge, you're really not gonna notice it. We're moving on now to the woven portion or the woven stitch portion of the scarf and this is one of my favorite stitches. I've used it so many times and I just love incorporating it in designs because it has such a unique texture. Well, as unique as that texture is, the motions for working the woven stitch are just as unique. So let's have a look at that. 
what we want to do, we've finished our first row. So if you're following along with the written instructions, that is row number one. Row number two, we're going to chain one and turn our work. Now we're working in rows just like we would for any other crocheted project. And that chain one does not count as our stitch. Chains are just a little bit harder to keep track of and to work into. So what we need to do is work a single crochet in the first stitch. So directly where that chain one is coming from, I can see the first stitch. I'll insert my hook there and make a single crochet. Now for the woven stitch. So the woven stitch is technically two stitches into one. So in order to maintain our stitch count, we have to work two stitches into one, but we also need to skip a stitch in between. So I'm going to skip the next stitch, focus my attention on the one right after that. To work the first part of the woven stitch, what you need to do is yarn over, then insert your hook, into that next stitch and pull up a loop. Now we have these three loops on our hook and what we need to do is pull this loop right here, this first one, through the second one. Now when we have two loops on our hook, we're going to yarn over and pull through both of those. So that's one half of the woven stitch. Now to do the next half, we're going to yarn over again, insert our hook into the same stitch, yarn over and pull up a loop. So it looks very similar to this point, right? We've got three loops on our hook. The only difference is that now we're gonna pull this loop through both of these loops. And that completes one woven stitch. So since technically we put two stitches into one, we have to skip the next stitch in order to maintain our stitch count and we're gonna woven stitch in that next one. So let's have a little review of the woven stitch. Now a little tip for you here, it's a little bit fiddly, a little bit fussy to try to get this loop through this one. So what I do in the background, you really can't see it, is I use my middle finger to push the work out. So that way I'm kind of pushing on that middle loop with my, with my middle finger back there and I can just easily slide my hook through. We'll finish that part and then same little trick applies for the second part only I'm kind of pushing a little bit further so I can walk it through both of those loops. You'll skip the next, make a woven stitch. And that is our repeat for row two, we're gonna work the woven stitch in every other stitch. So don't forget that we're skipping one in between. And the last stitch, we're gonna work a single crochet. And when you get to the end of your row, I have just worked my woven stitch. I have two stitches left. I wanna maintain my pattern, so I'm gonna skip that next stitch and then work a single crochet into the last stitch. Now don't get your last stitch confused with the chain one because you can see that. See, so if you turn to the side, you can see a V that could easily be mistaken for a stitch, but just know that that's your chain. Now the first thing that we want to do, just like before, we're gonna find our first stitch and make a single crochet there because our chain one does not count as a stitch. So then we're gonna skip one stitch and work a woven stitch into the next. And then skip the next stitch, woven stitch in the next. And we're not changing anything here, we're just simply reviewing. Here's another little difference. When you get to the end of row three, which is our repeated row, this time we work our woven stitch in the second to last. That's just how the pattern works out. And then we have one stitch remaining. We're gonna single crochet into that last stitch. So that's what you need to do at this point. Just repeat the last row that we covered over and over until it measures about two inches from your starting edge right here. Once you finish that, we're gonna take a look at how to fasten off very quickly 
And then we'll talk about the finishing touches because we're almost finished at this point. Once you've worked that stitch pattern so that this little section measures about two inches, we're ready to fasten off. So to do that, we're just going to trim ourselves a tail that's about eight inches. We're gonna use this tail to weave in later. And we can simply pull that tail through the loop on our hook that's gonna fasten off this edge. And now what we need to do is repeat the same thing on the other side. The last thing we need to do are a couple of finishing touches. We're gonna to add some tassels here to each side of our scarf, again, mini scarf here. So we're gonna make a total of six tassels, and then we'll of course just need to weave in these ends. So to find a resource on how to make a tassel by hand, I, I'll link to it here on your screen, but you'll just head over to behookedcrochet.com slash tassel. That's gonna show you the video tutorial on how to make a tassel by hand. Or if you do have one of those tassel makers by Clover, then of course those are very handy and easy to use. So I have my tassel here. It's about four inches long. We do wanna make these nice and thick and full, but this is a good opportunity to change things up a little bit. If you're not into tassels, you could do fringe, you could add palms, or you could just completely leave the edges as they are. They are a little raw, like you see here, and I'm gonna do some wet blocking in order to clean things up. So wet blocking is a really great technique that's gonna help you to kind of take that next step and hit that next level in your projects. I have a resource on that as well, behookedcrochet.com slash block your project. That's gonna walk you through the different ways that you can block your project and how to do that with the video tutorial. Now to weave in the ends, the first thing I wanna do is make sure I'm working on the wrong side of the scarf. So once again, where you can see this nice pretty braid, this is the right side. And so we wanna weave in our ends on the wrong side. And just a quick rule of thumb that I always try to use when I'm weaving in ends is find the densest portion of stitches and weave the ends in there. So I have an end where I fastened off from the woven stitch pattern. I'm gonna make sure I weave that end under one of these rows of stitches here. And then I have two little tails from the spine. Now you can weave those ends up the spine as well. And then of course we have our fasten on edge and a tail on the opposite side. We're gonna weave those into the woven stitch pattern. So tackling this end first, I wanna make sure that I'm weaving the tail along the same color. And keep in mind too, I'm working with a much shorter version of what the scarf actually is. So your color transitions, your stripes, are gonna look quite a bit different than this on the full size because they're gonna be stretched out over the full length of the scarf rather than just this little snippet here. So just find your first row where the tail matches the row of stitches and just weave it in underneath going in one direction and then you can rotate it around and work back in the opposite direction. And a little trick to keeping your ends to stay in is to kind of be sloppy during this process. As you split the yarn, that's actually gonna help the end stay in place. So when I do this, I, I really try not to be perfect with it. I just stick my needle wherever. As long as it's not showing on the other side, I know I'm good to go. Now for one of these little tails, we're gonna use the dense part of the spine to weave in these ends and also to kind of clean up the edge there. You can see there's a little bit of a, of a tail. And what I like to do is just kind of weave it in and out. And just apply the same strategies where I go in for a few stitches and then I work back in the other direction and I'm just a little bit sloppy with it so I'm splitting the yarn and allowing it to stay in place that way. Now when you get to the end that's from the spine 
that is directly next to this free and open loop here. I want you to treat that a little bit different because we're gonna use this tail to help secure that loop. So the first thing we'll need to do is of course thread that on our darning needle and then just run the tail through that group. And we're gonna pull it back in this direction. So I'm working on the wrong side of the work, but just holding that there, when we look at how that holds it in place, well, we know that it's gonna lock it in place, but it also helps to sort of maintain the look on the other side. So once you get that threaded through, what you'll do is just weave in your end along the spine, this little section of stitches. I'm using that term loosely. I'm not really sure if I just made that up, but it makes sense to me. So just weave in your end along this really dense portion of stitches. and then we can trim that off. So the last thing we need to do is attach the tassels. We're gonna make three per side. We'll attach one at each corner and then one in the middle where that braid is. So it's pretty simple to do this. When you make your tassel, you're going to have your two strands up at the top and you can start at any point, honestly. Just pick out where you want to start. I'm going to just put this in through the middle and I'm just going to work it into the braid. So I'm just kind of catching one side to the next and again it's always a good idea here to work on the wrong side because we're, we are going to tie this off. So you'll just situate that in and then tie it off tie it into place with a double knot. And then that is going to help kind of finish things off with the braid. It actually makes it look like the braid is part of the tassel. So to add the tassel to the corner, you're just gonna use your crochet hook. Again, working this on the wrong side of the work. And then just use your crochet hook to help you pull these tails through the stitch. So I've got that tail worked under the first stitch and I'll just use that next stitch. Pull the other tail through that one and then I can tie it off. And so you'll have your two tassels at each corner. You'll have your one in the middle. And if you need some guidance on making tassels, there are a couple of resources that I have available. And there are some really cool tools out there that will help you make these. So if you don't have a tassel maker, you can make them by hand. It's really simple. I have a resource for you on that. And you'll find that. I'll link to it here on your screen. But the address is bhcrochet.com slash tassel. That's gonna show you how to make a tassel just like this, completely by hand. You only need your yarn and your scissors. Now, once you have all of your tassels in place, you've woven in all of your ends, the last thing you need to do is just enjoy. <laughs> 